Great to have you here this morning. I, I hope you are in the mood to do a little bit of work um, because what we're talking about today, I already know that when I ask the question, how many of you want this type of person in your life? Most everybody's gonna be like, oh yeah, yeah. But I want you to understand <laughs> Uh, What we're talking about today is not as simple as do you want it. It's much more complicated than that, and it's really more of an issue of can you handle it. Last weekend, Timmy kind of started a a two-week run on Friends. The title of this series is Friends, Family, and Foes, and he started talking about Jonathan, and last week's message is one of my favorite messages in a while, and here's why. I've never heard anybody try and connect the robe, the tunic, the belt, the bow, and the sword as to what it could represent as he lays those things down before David. That was absolute gangsterness right there. And I I hope you are, because listen, my whole life changed once God gave me my David or Jonathan. I don't care which one I am, just give it to me, Lord. You know what I'm saying? My whole life changed. And remember, kingdom math is such. One puts a thousand to flight but two coming together in agreement with God as the cord, the, the third strand in the cord of three strands, two put 10,000 to flight. And so I, I want you, and listen, I know some of you were a little squirmy last week, and here's the way Tim and I talk about it when we teach on intimate friendship. If, if you don't squirm a little bit, when we teach on intimate friendship, we didn't do our job right. So some of y'all were like, this, is this weird? This, no, it's just different to you. And it was different to me until God gave it to me. I mean, he told a little bit of the story the first time we sat down at Cheesecake. You know, I, I, at the end, so we'd spent three and a half hours. God literally sat at the table. We both felt it. And then he goes, we got to pray to finish this. And he puts out his hands like this. And I'm like, uh, I don't want to hold your hands right now. I just met you but I feel obligated to, so I held his hands. So you know when you're holding hands with somebody in prayer in a public place like that, if if you're immature the way I was when we first met 15 plus years ago, I'm like, okay, pray quick, you know? (laughs) And if you've ever heard Timmy pray at the beginning of a message, you know he prays very quickly. On this day, he did not. (laughs) He was long-winded. We prayed for over 15 minutes. I felt it was just the Lord. My eyes were closed. I felt the Lord was just going like, bro, you are messed up. Then we get done and he goes, I love you. (laughs) No, I can't. I can't. Because at that time, I didn't say I love you to anybody, anybody. And part of the reason was because I'd been hurt by a few people I had said it to. So I was like, I didn't even realize I had made an inner vow. I'm never saying those words to anybody. Isn't it funny how when you tell the Lord never, he sends you someone for now? Timmy's like, I love you. I just met you. I'm going to love you for the rest of my life. And I'm like, thank you. But God's done such a work in my heart. And now I realize why I was so kind of opposed to it in the beginning. Because the enemy is deathly afraid when two of God's children come together to fight. So this weekend, we're talking about kind of the other half of the type of friends that I believe we all need. We're talking about Nathan. And the title of the message is, Can You Handle a Nathan? Not do you want a Nathan, can you handle a Nathan? And this message and the burden for it is essentially, I I want you to have a Nathan, but even more than that, I want you to be a Nathan, all right? And let me kind of distinguish the difference between Jonathan and Nathan, but before I give it to you, let me remind you, in my opinion, this is kind of my framework, my perspective as we jump into this conversation about Nathan. In my opinion, you cannot pull the call of God on your life off without God-given and God-sent friends. Let me help you see how I see the difference between Jonathan and Nathan. Jonathan was given by God to David. Nathan was sent by God to David. Jonathan was given to David to help him enjoy his life. 
Nathan was sent to David to help him steward his life. Now, can a friend be both? A Jonathan and Nathan, absolutely. I feel like that's what Timmy is for me. I hope I am for him. Absolutely. It's not like you have to have separate friends. What we're talking about is, are these principles of intimate friendship. And, and if we're going to be these people, there are certain things we must do and also certain things we must not do. I'm going to give you three things so that we can understand what is a Nathan like. If I'm going to be able to answer the question, can I even handle a Nathan? Let's first answer the question, what is Nathan like? Three things. Here's the first one. A Nathan is supportive of you. A Nathan is supportive of you. Now, if you've got a Bible, flip to 2 Samuel chapter 7. We're going to be in chapter 7 and chapter 12 of 2 Samuel. I know for some of you, your first thought is, wait a minute, Preston, this is kind of assumed, isn't it? That friends should be supportive. I totally get that, but we have lots of friends who support us in various ways and at varying levels. Not all friends support you in the same way. They're not designed to. Let's talk for a minute about, about disappointment in friendship over what some of us call a lack of support. If you expect a friend to give constant support when what they have to give is occasional support, you're going to be disappointed in your friend and disenfranchised with the friendship. Never expect someone to be what they are incapable of being. Try and always be more grateful for what your friends bring to your life than you do gripe about what they do not bring to your life. And never forget, when one friend doesn't bring something you need into your life, it's simply because God designed someone else to. Don't put your disappointment in not having something on someone who was never designed to bring that something into your life. Not everybody can be a Nathan. So don't go home today and be like, all my friends got to be Nathan. No, no, no. You need one. You just need one friend in your life to adopt these characteristics and to live according to these principles. Nathan was an extremely supportive friend to King David. Let's read about it. 2 Samuel chapter 7, starting in verse 1. When King David was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all the surrounding enemies, the king summoned Nathan the prophet. Now, the reason he summoned him wasn't just because he was the man of God. They were friends. He was calling on his friend. And you're going to see why. He's processing some really important things. David says, look, I'm living in a beautiful cedar palace, but the ark of God is out there in a tent. Okay, hit the pause button before I read Nathan's response in verse 3. I kind of imagine that the way this went down, it's nighttime, there's a huge storm. I mean, it's raining cats and dogs and massive winds like a West Texas middle of the night storm. Here David is safe and dry in a palace that was made for him. And outside the walls of the palace is the tent where God's presence was. Because David was so obsessed with God and God's presence, I just wonder if that night, he's just, he's restless. This cannot be. I don't like this. And he, and he summons Nathan, his friend. And he says, listen, this is not okay. I'm living in a palace. The presence of God is out there in a tent. Here's Preston's paraphrase. I have one thing in my heart to do with this life I've been given. I want to build him a house better than mine. Now watch Nathan's response. And you see the supportive friend and his initial response. Verse three, Nathan replied to the king, go ahead and do whatever you have in mind. Some translations say, do whatever is in your heart to do. For the Lord is with you. Remember, God sent friends are cooperative never complicit. The word cooperative means mutual assistance in working toward a common goal. The word complicit means involved with others in an illegal activity or wrongdoing. Nathan isn't saying to the king, whatever you say, king. He's not being a yes man. What he's actually saying is, David, 
I feel there are two reasons why my initial response to what you just told me was do whatever's in your heart to do. Here, here, here are my two reasons. First, this sounds like a very godly endeavor. Can we not agree that desiring to build a temple for the Lord is a godly endeavor? Can we agree on that? Then he goes further and he says, but even more than that, I know because I've seen God is with you. So my initial response, based on those two things, this appears to be a godly endeavor, and I have seen that God is with you because of those two factors, here's my initial response as your friend, not just the man of God. Do whatever's in your heart to do. That's his initial response. Okay, this needs to be our inward bent as friends. We're not yes men or yes women. We're supportive friends. That's our initial response. But have you ever had a friend who when you told them something which was in your heart to do, they told you you shouldn't do it? Before they even asked the Lord if you should, you ever had a friend like that? Don't raise your hand because you might be sitting next to him. Too many people determine what you should do based off of what they would do or want you to do. That's not a Nathan. That's manipulation. That's ignorance. I'm not telling you to be a yes man, but I am saying our inward bent towards our friends, if they're walking with God and what they bring for advice is a godly endeavor, our initial response needs to be support before we pray about it. I have a friend who is in the coffee sector, and he, he's a guy um, that a lot of people know around the valley for being a, a really wise um, human as it relates to I call what I call heaven's favorite bean, the coffee bean. And we had coffee a couple weeks ago, and he starts, he's just talking. And he starts talking about, he does a lot of traveling around the world to find these fields that are growing coffee beans that no one is accessing. And so I'm thinking, yeah, this guy's passionate about coffee. He's telling me stories about how, you know, like a super sleuth, he finds these amazing fields with amazing beans. And then he turned on a dime and spends like 45 minutes talking about the farmers by name in the field where these beans nobody's heard about are being grown. It was a pretty great coffee. Well, uh, last night, or, or I guess Friday night, uh, he texts me and he goes, hey, just praying about a, a new venture. Give me your honest feedback. He said, do you think that coffee and compassion could be merged in the market? You know, like Tom Shoes, uh, Charity Water. There, there are lots of different things. He said, do you think these two things could could be merged and that kingdom-minded people would ever get behind it. And here is my response. Before I tell you, let me tell you what the 22-year-old me would have said. This is what the 22-year-old me would have said. I don't think that's going to work. Honestly, that's what I would have said. I, I know one or two people who've stepped into this space and the, the percentage of people who get behind something like this is a lot smaller than people who just go to Starbucks or whatever coffee spot. I don't know that this is going to work. That's how I would have responded at 22. At 45, having been, been around the block a little bit, you know how I responded? This is exactly what I said. If something like this is going to work, it's going to require someone who carries a heavy burden for the farmers by name and their families and their legacies. It's going to require someone like that for God to bless to step into this space. You see what that is? That's a supportive Nathan. I'm not being a yes man, but I'm also not putting on him because if I would have said, I don't think that's gonna work, here's what I'm really saying. If I did that, it wouldn't work. But here's what you gotta remember if you're gonna roll as a Nathan. God's not asking you to do it. He's asking them to do it. So you don't need to pray about if you did it, would it work? You need to pray about if God's asking them to do it, will God divinely enable and anoint them to do it? Question, when your friends come to you for advice, 
or submitting something they feel like God's saying? Are you quick to throw out no's faster than you throw out yeses? I used to be. I remember when Cody came to me one day, he came to my office and he goes, I've been traveling with Carrie for a while now and I like her. And she's been like a sister to me and we are very, very close friends, but I'd, I'd like to see if she would, would want to date me. What do you think? And here's what I said. Well, if it were me, I would take a look. Am I willing to risk this friendship just for a date? And I said, if it were me, I wouldn't do it. Think about this. If Cody would have listened to what I said, he may not have ever married Carrie. It was bad advice. And after they started dating and I saw God's hand was on it, I went back to him and I said, you know what I love about you? You give me room to be dumb every once in a while. <laughs> but I learned something. It was much bigger than them. Before you dole out, it's not actually advice, it's opinion. Before you dole out opinion, when someone comes to you for godly wisdom, pray about it before you talk about it. This is what Nathan does. He didn't do it at first, but he does it next. As we move to this next part, let me just remind you, God sent friends are not yes men or yes women. They are yes if God says yes, and no if God says no, men and women. That brings us to the second point. A Nathan is submitted to God. Nathan is supportive of you, but he's submitted to God. Keep going in verse 4. Watch how quickly things turn. But that same night, after they just had this awesome moment as friends, that same night, the Lord said to Nathan. And before I tell you what God says to him, let me remind you just how important it is for God sent friends, if you're going to be sent into someone's life as a Nathan, how important it is to hear God's voice. God sent friends listen to God even more than they listen to you. The people I get the most advice from listen to me and they listen even more to God on my behalf. One of the best gifts you will ever give your friends is a pair of ears which clearly hear God. People ask me from time to time about hearing God's voice. Preston, how do I know the voice I'm hearing is God? And, and sometimes if I'm, I'm feeling a little ornery, I, I answer it like this. I say, well, God always agrees with himself and often disagrees with me. That's how I know the voice I'm hearing is him. So let me, let me break this down for you if you're still learning how to discern the voice of God. God never disagrees with himself. If you want to know what God sounds like, read this book right here. He never disagrees with himself. But on top of that, he often disagrees with me. If the voice you typically hear that you think is God always agrees with you, that ain't God. Because you're not God, and his ways are higher than your ways. His thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Want to know who typically agrees with you and your flesh? God's enemy. God always agrees with himself, but often disagrees with us. Remember, this message isn't about, do you want a Nathan? It's, can you handle a Nathan? What does it mean that a Nathan is submitted to God while supportive of you? It means Nathan will tell you what God wants you to hear, especially if and when it's what you don't want to hear. Keep going in verse 5. This is what God says to Nathan. Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord has declared. And watch this question. He starts firing bullets from the get-go. Are you the one to build a house for me to live in? You know what God is saying when he says this to David through Nathan? Preston's paraphrase. God is saying, did I ask you to do this? That's how he's starting it off. This is what correction and conviction sound like. Hey, David, I love it, but did I ask you to do this? Nathans are open to real-time correction from God. In fact, they crave it. Here's why. 
You cannot be used by God to lovingly rebuke someone for their benefit when you are willingly living in rebellion to your detriment. This is why Nathan's love to be corrected. Nathan at first said yes, but then God said no. So what does Nathan do? Nathan says no. A friend who says yes when God says no is not supportive. They are destructive. You don't want that kind of friend. They're called liars. You want yes when God says yes and no when God says no, friends. The number one thing King David had in his heart was to build the temple for the Lord. But here's the catch. It was in David's heart to build the temple, but it wasn't in God's heart for David to be the one to build the temple. Here's another way to say it. Just because something is in your heart doesn't mean it's in God's will. Just because you want to do something doesn't mean God will endorse and anoint you to do it. It is not godly to build something God didn't tell you to build. It's actually boldly disobedient. If God doesn't tell you to build it, he's telling you he doesn't want you to build it. So here's what you have to decide. Am I Lord or is Jesus my Lord? Are you here to do whatever you want? Or are you here to do whatever Jesus asks? This is actually the verse I use with church planners and people praying about starting a business. Those two endeavors, this is the verse I use if they ever come to me and say, I'm praying about starting a church or starting a business. And I go right here. Sounds like an amazing endeavor, a godly endeavor. David says, I want to build the Lord a temple. It doesn't matter how godly it sounds if God doesn't ask you to do it. If you do it and God doesn't ask you to, there's a word for that, disobedience. Well, Preston, I thought disobedience is when God asks you to do something, you don't do it. No, it goes both ways. Just because something, I know I'm stepping on some toes this morning, but I love this part of my job, honestly, because we all need this. The enemy comes and says, hey, do whatever's in your heart to do. That sounds so good and so godly. Go do it. If God says, don't do it. But even beyond that, if God doesn't ask me to do it, I don't want to do it. Can you handle a Nathan? Can you handle a friend, a godly and trusted friend, bringing you God's no? Because Nathan is submitted to God, when God says no, even though Nathan at first said yes, Nathan brings a no. Remember this. Correction from God-sent friends leads you to worship, not to war. This is where we see this principle in David's response. I just want you to put yourself in David's position. Go to your great example. Run your own business. David runs the kingdom. You know what I'm saying? Everybody's serving you. You know what I mean? And imagine you saying as the CEO, I have one thing in my heart to do. And you go to somebody in your organization and they bring God's no. But you were sold. I mean, this is it. This is what the breakthrough is going to come through. But God says no through somebody. Just put yourself in David's shoes. How would we respond? The more sold we are that it's God, possibly the more frustrated we are when we hear God say no through somebody, right? David's the king. Nathan is not. David could have flexed like some of us would have. Bro, do you not know who I am? I'm the king. You don't talk to the king like that. But he doesn't. Watch how David responds when he hears God tell him no when Nathan brings God's no. Look in verse 18. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord and prayed. He goes into worship. He just heard a no in regards to the one thing he wanted to do more than anything else. And his first reaction is not to gripe or to power play. His first response is to go in the private presence of God and worship and pray. Listen to what he says. Who am I 
So instead of saying, bro, do you not know I'm the king? He takes the opposite approach before God and says, who is little old me? Oh, sovereign Lord. And what is my family that you have brought me this far? Now, why does he bring up his family? I didn't read the verses in between the no and this. What God says is, David, you're not the man to build my temple, temple, but your son will be. You're not, but someone in your family will. And listen to me. I know you want to build me a house, but I'm going to build you a house. And your family's legacy is going to last forever. Okay, so think about this. He hears a no and a yes. You see which one he's focused on. Verse 19, and now, sovereign Lord, in addition to everything else, you speak of giving your, living, your, your servant a lasting dynasty. Do you deal with everyone this way, O sovereign Lord? This is how friends talk. What more can I say to you? You know what your servant is really like, sovereign Lord. Because of your promise and according to your will, you have done all these great things and have made them known to your servant. How great you are, O sovereign Lord. There is no one like you. We have never even heard of another God like you. This, this is crazy. There was one thing in his heart to do, and God just told him no. And this is how homeboy responds. He's a template. He is our template. God says yes, and God says no. The question isn't how does God respond to our requests? The question is, how do you respond to his answers? David is a template for handling a huge no from God, whereas Jonah is a case study on how not to handle a no. David is a template. And here's what David teaches us about God's no's. And if you're struggling with a no from God, you need to write this down. This may be the most important one-liner in this message. God's no is always a divine setup for God's yes. His no's always lead to his yes. Let me try and illustrate this. Let's say my oldest son, Tyler, comes to me one night and he says, Dad, I want to go to dinner at Chipotle with my friends. And I say, I'm sorry, buddy, but not tonight. And because Tyler was so excited to hear me say yes, but heard no, let's just say, just for illustrational purposes, not that this would ever happen, but he gets a little temperamental and upset with me because he heard me say no. But then I tell him why I said no. And I say, but I have a really unexpected surprise for you. I've booked two tickets to fly out tonight to Monterey, California. And in the morning, the two of us have the first tea time at Pebble Beach. And the weatherman says, there's going to be fog on the number one tee. And if you know anything about golf, you know that's the dreamiest, other than St. Andrews, fog on the number one tee at Pebble Beach is the dreamiest thing on the planet. Question. Am I a bad dad for saying no in that situation? Here's a better and extremely more loaded theological question. Would I be a bad dad if I changed my plan, even though it was the better plan, in order to say yes to my son's plan, which was the exponentially worse plan for both of us? A good father does what is best for his child rather than always saying yes to his child. The sooner you sweetly and confidently move on from God saying no, the more room you are making for God to bring his extravagant yes. But here's what some of us are doing. We are griping with God because he said no to Chipotle. Now, I love me some Chipotle three nights a week. But some of us are angry with God because he said no to Chipotle. But because his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts higher than our thoughts and we don't know the end from the beginning, we are unaware that tickets are coming in the mail to jump on a plane with him, go play golf alone with him at one of the most picturesque courses in the country. 
But because we don't like the word no, we're willing to throw the entire trip away because we're addicted to yes? Bro, you can have your Chipotle. <laughs> Give me the no's. I remember Pastor Robert said to me one time, he goes, Preston, you will know when God is moving in greater ways based off of the no's, not the yeses. This is why. I, and, and I don't know what, what the elders necessary to think when I do these things, but when I come and I say, out loud, let's pray. I feel like there may be a building and I don't get specific, but I say, let's be praying. I think there's a building. And then the Lord makes it obvious that his answer is no. I celebrate it. Here's one of the ways you know you're walking with God when you consistently hear God's no's. Why are you griping about the thing you should be celebrating? He only says no to those he's closest to. The ones who are furthest just assume he always say yes. Why are you griping when you hear him say no? Every one of his no's is divinely designed to create room for his extravagant yes. This is why I believe David celebrated when God told him no about the number one thing he wanted more than anything. God told David no. And Nathan told David no, but David focused on God's yes, not on his no. Before we move to this third one, I want you to remember this principle. Please don't ever cancel a friend committed to God just because they carry God's no. The best friends tell you what God says rather than what they think. Don't cancel somebody because you want them to say yes. Listen, I, I was raised a certain way uh, at Gateway. I was not raised to be a yes man. I was raised to be a yes when God says yes and no when God says no. So here's what that means. Never ask me to be on your board if what you want is a constant yes. Now, I'm not going to be an, anta an antagonistic no. And if you're somebody who always says no before you say yes, you need to dig around and figure out why. Maybe you're insecure and you don't want anyone else to succeed, but you don't even know to be aware of that. Listen, I, I don't have time for people in my life who feel it's their job to say no before they even talk to God to see if God says yes. The older I get and the closer I get to walking out the full call of God on my life, I realize I need to be surrounded by Nathans, not know-it-alls. Nathans go to God and ask God what he thinks. Know-it-alls tell you what they think before they talk to God about it. Let's get to point number three, shall we? This one's going to hurt some of us a little bit, but a good kind of hurt. Hurt so good. What's a Nathan like? Point number three, a Nathan is strong with you. A Nathan is strong with you. Now, before those of you who are like type A, just run people over, let me help you understand what we're really talking about. We aren't talking about calling out a friend at the behest of your emotions. We're talking about confronting your friend at the request of God. If you're in 2 Samuel 7, flip over to 2 Samuel 12. Starting in verse 1. Between 7 and 12, what goes down, I talked about this two weeks ago, David and Bathsheba, David gets her pregnant. David has her husband murdered. And now, because Bathsheba's pregnant, those five chapters kind of eclipse over a, an at least six-month period of time, all right? So as we get to 2 Samuel 12, verse 1, just know Bathsheba is believed to be six or seven months pregnant by now, okay? Ladies, I don't know a ton about pregnancy. How many of you would say at six or seven months, she's showing pretty well? Like, just, just so I know. Did we put your hand up? Because I'm ignorant. Okay, great. Just so we have that context. Let's read this. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 1. So the Lord sent Nathan. Now you see why I call him a God-sent friend. Because God said he sent him. The Lord sent Nathan, the prophet, 
to tell David this story. This one verse right here is incredible for those of us trying to be more like Nathan for our Davids. Now you see why I'm calling Nathan this God-sent friend. He, he, he wasn't a God-suggested friend. God literally sent him. You need to remember, God desires to send you into the lives of some Davids, some Debras, who are going to do mighty things for the kingdom, some on the radar, some off the radar, but God desires to send you as a Nathan into their life. You don't just walk into people's life as a Nathan. God sends you into their life. But I want you to notice something else before I read you what's next. Nathan doesn't flex on David. For those of you who have some Davids in your life and they have more authority, more power than you, maybe in your organization, and you're thinking, yeah, see, th this writes the, the authority structure. Because I'm a Nathan and he's a David. That means sometimes I'm going to be above him. Okay, that's not how God talks. All right? Not at all how God talks. Nathan doesn't flex on David when he could have. God tells Nathan how to handle this. Nathan saw his friend sinned over and over and over again. And Nathan doesn't go into David's presence and go, bro, what is wrong with you? He doesn't do that at all. Watch how he does it. And this is textbook template for those of us trying to be more like Nathan with our Davids. Look at the rest of verse one. As this, this is the story God gave Nathan to tell David. There were two men in a certain town. One was rich and one was poor. The rich man owned a great many sheep and cattle. The poor man owned nothing but one little lamb he had bought. He raised that little lamb and it grew up with his children. It ate from the man's own plate and drank from his cup. He cuddled it in his arms like a baby daughter. One day, a guest arrived at the home of the rich man. But instead of killing an animal from his own flock or herd, he took the poor man's lamb and killed it and prepared it for his guest. Watch verse 5. David was furious. As surely as the Lord lives, he vowed, any man who would do such a thing deserves to die. He must repay four lambs to the poor man for the one he stole and for having no pity. And watch this. Some of the most gangster words in all of scripture, in my opinion. Then Nathan said to David, you are that man. This is like the most gangster setup I've ever seen. Notice Nathan doesn't go in screaming. He goes in storytelling, because that's what God told him to do. God sent friends bring conviction when you're convinced you got away with something you were hoping God wasn't watching. Isn't it funny how when we're not healthy, we think nobody else can see it? I don't know if this rains on your parade, but some of us actually think when we're not in a good place that no one else can see it. Let me tell you how obvious it is to see. It's as obvious as a woman who's seven months pregnant. Is that obvious? When you're not in the best place, it's obvious to those who love you most. Well, why is it so obvious, Preston? Here's my personal belief. God's given them eyes to see to help protect you. But if you'd rather look awesome, even though you're doing horrifically, carry on. But God sends Nathans into our lives to say, hey, bro, this is a safe place, but you are not good. You are that man. He doesn't yell. He doesn't scream. He just does what God asks him to do. He doesn't bring his opinion. He brings God's words. A godly friend never stays silent about your sin, but the way they approach it and address it is crucial. Notice in the story, the person who was right and righteous wasn't the one yelling. It was the person who was wrong who was yelling. Notice 
Conviction doesn't come into the room and say, you are so bad. Conviction comes in and says, you are that man. Notice, the righteous one gently exposes the sin. The self-righteous one angrily demands. Now watch how King David responds when conviction walks into the room from God through Nathan. Verse 13, then David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. I know some of us, this is not how we think repentance goes. We think God has to just like divinely spank us and hurt us and scream at us. That is not how this goes. David didn't just sleep with Bathsheba and get her pregnant out of wedlock. He had her husband murdered. And then he hides it for seven months. And God sends Nathan as a friend of David, but also a friend of God, to bring conviction into the room so that David didn't have to live covering and concealing his sin any longer. David knows he's been found out, humbles himself real time and says, Nathan, I'm an idiot. I've sinned against the Lord. I know I am that man. And watch how Nathan, probably a better way to say this, watch how God responds through Nathan in the very next verse. The rest of verse 13, Nathan replies, yes, but the Lord has forgiven you and you won't die for this sin. We all need Nathan, all of us. If you think you can pull off the call of God in your life by yourself, you are gravely mistaken. But more than that, why would you want to? We all need Nathan in our lives. Someone who will be first response supportive to us. But more than supportive of us, submitted to God. And then when necessary, strong with us because of God. The question isn't, do you want a Nathan? The question is, can you even handle a Nathan? There are things God wants to do in this next season of your life that will not take place if you kick Nathan out of your life. Nathans aren't sent to rule your life. Jesus is Lord of your life. Nathans are sent to help you steward your life and the call of God on your life. So whatever you have to do, do what must be done so that in God's eyes, you are one who can handle a Nathan.